We are indeed pleased to have with us the plenary panel of eminent persons uh, whose uh, convener uh, is uh, Jenny Brocky from SBS Television Australia's Insight program. Jenny um, is a journalist, a documentary filmmaker and interviewer uh, with a unique set of skills very well known in Australia. Uh, the panel members are Simon McKeon AO, Chairman of AMP CSIRO, Executive Chairman of the Macquarie Group Victoria. Uh, Simon uh, is a prominent investment banker and record-breaking yachtsman. First time we've had somebody on the sea instead of in it. And in 1994, he trans transitioned into a part-time role as Executive Chairman of Macquarie Group's Melbourne office enabling him to support a range of causes and organisations, including joining the board of World Vision Australia. Simon is currently chairman of the CSIRO and Business for Millennium Development, which encourages business to engage with the developing world. We also have with us Amanda, Amanda McWashi. Amanda uh, was born in Twickenham, Middlesex, UK, of Zambian parentage. She obtained a law degree and uh, also a degree in international economic law. She has pursued a career in international development, working towards reduction of poverty and combating inequalities and injustices in developing countries as well as in developed countries. We also have with us Robert Fitzgerald AM, Productivity Commissioner and Commissioner on the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. Uh, one of the big stories in Australia at the moment, and also importantly for this conference, Chair of the Australian Charities Commission. Robert has experience in commerce, law, public policy and community services. Um, and uh, uh, as you can guess from his uh, various public roles at the moment, uh, is an eminent Australian. And lastly, but by no means least, we have Catherine Yeomans. <laughs> Catherine is the CEO of Mission Australia, a board member and senior business executive. She ensures that the voices of excluded people are heard. Her areas of expertise include formulating and implementing strategy, working collaboratively with boards and industry stakeholders, motivating and leading an executive team, influencing policy and lobbying for change to benefit people in need, and ensuring operational efficiency and sustainable growth. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome our convener and panel for this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ralph. And uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, and the topic that we're going to be discussing today, um, I think, has, has great currency in terms of what's in the news at the moment. Um, the issue that, that Ralph has just raised that we've observed a moment, silence over uh, and so on. We're talking about building engaged communities and the role that volunteering plays in that and the role it could play in the future. Uh, I'm hoping that you get involved in this discussion as much as we will. Um, we do have a couple of roving mics going around, so should you have any questions, I'm certainly going to be going to the audience for questions. If you have questions for the panel a little bit later on, please put up your hand, or if at any stage during our conversation you'd like to uh, participate, please do. I'll be looking. You might need to yell out at me because there are so many of you. Um, so just stand up if you can, if you've got a question you'd like to ask. Um, what I'd like to start with, given you're, you're a very diverse group, which is great, you know, you're coming at this topic from very different points of view, so I want to ask you all um, a very basic question, which is what do you think volunteering is from your own perspectives? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think it is, Simon? <laughs> what? Yeah, Simon. Well, I wish you hadn't asked me because I actually quickly gave my definition to Robert just a few minutes ago and he said I was probably wrong. Can you just pull, <laughs> can you just pull the mic over? Well, that's why I'm asking you because yeah. I suspect you'll well, argue about look, it. Go, I'm, go I'm, on. I'm the dumb one on the panel but all I said was surely it's something about the giving of our time and I'm going to stop there because Robert had a response to that. Which is? Oh, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but that's, I mean, I, I, from my point of view, if I can just personalise it, I think it's actually a way of thinking and a way of life. I think it's actually a, a state of mind. 
in which you're prepared to actually do things, to give time and energy for the benefit of others and yourself without the expectation of financial or material rewards. But at the end of the day, I think it is actually about trying to make a change, make society within which we live um, a little bit better. And we seek to do that by our own contributions as well as all the other things we do. So it's sort of that, that notion, but I do think for most volunteers, it does become a way of life and I'm absolutely certain it's a way of thinking or seeing the world, which is different from those that don't volunteer. So you think it's more than giving your time? It's, it's more engaged than just giving your time? I'm not directing traffic, but you really now need to go to Amanda because she chipped in at this point. Oh. And gave, a, <laughs> gave a completely okay, fascinating... OK, I'm just going to sit here yeah, I know, and, I'm and sorry, let Jenny, Simon run the panel. I reckon that's a great idea. You weren't in the, on this conversation, but Amanda, okay, you, you were OK, I didn't hear any of this, so you go, Amanda. Go. OK, thank you. Greetings. Um, uh, maybe just to sort of uh, contextualise what I said when I was talking to Simon and Robert. Um, I want to read you a quote um, which is an, uh, from, this, uh, from this land, from this country, and it says, um, we are all visitors to this time, this place. We are just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. And so my contribution to the conversation that uh, Simon and Robert uh, were having uh, was that for me, uh, volunteerism is the essence of, of, of who we are, what we do here and what we leave behind. And um, I, I'm from Zambia, so it is really embedded in the concept of Ubuntu, which means that uh, it's more than just giving. It is uh, reaffirming my existence and my humanity as, a, as, as an individual. I am because you are, and together we are. That is uh, the essence or the manifestation of, uh, of uh, volunteerism. All right, so a much bigger yes. thing yes. about who you are as a person. Yes. Yeah, Catherine? Um, I think uh, volunteering is really about valuing um, other people. And it's actually treating other people as we would like to be treated ourselves. And it's recognising that oftentimes there is a need, um, perhaps that need isn't being met, uh, and it's, it's what we do in order to meet that need. Do you think all these very noble sentiments are the way it's always played out, though, in practice? Mm. Um, well, we know the answer to that is no, because not all volunteering is good and beneficial. Um, and not all of it, um, if you want to look at, is, is as noble as we've said. But one of the things is I don't think you can sustain volunteerism in your own life um, without um, those sorts of elements. Um, yes, you can go off and do something for the neighbour, which in and of itself is very valuable. And in Amanda's definition, uh, may well be volunteering. But to sustain the effort that we see in the people in this room and others, it requires more than just that. And I think what we're starting to see is the notion of genuine engagement with other people. It's not the giving of or the doing to or doing for, it is that engagement. Now, not all volunteering involves that. Some things you just do and that's enough. But there is this notion of relationship forming, engagement, and that's an emerging thing. Now, you don't form engagements or relationships in this space unless there are some sort of value set or, or overriding set of um, um, drivers for the long haul. Mm, and engagement isn't about giving to, necessarily, is it? I mean, engagement is about, is about a relationship of some kind. Don't, don't you think? I mean, from a business perspective, Simon, I'm interested in that. Whether yep. you know you think of it in those terms, do you, do you think do you think businesses think of volunteering as some form of engagement, I, or do you think they think of it as something that's noble that they'll kind of do as part or do to others as part of yeah. social responsibility? G Jenny, as with anything, you know, we tend to generalise, which is dangerous. Mm. I see in business. I spend a third of my time in business, about a third with government, and a third with non-for-profit, and the other third I go sailing, but um, um, I, I, I actually see very similar people in each of those three sectors, but actually marching to the beat of a slightly different drum for obvious reasons. And, uh, but what I would say is that, you know, to the extent that I do spend time in business and people are listening to what I have to say about what we're talking today, um, I unashamedly uh, try and emphasise that it's not a bad thing to look at what works for us as individuals. And the wonderful thing about 
volunteering is that the choice, let's face it, is unlimited. And I actually spend more time talking about what works for you, what's going to be sustainable, what's actually going to mean the difference between you doing it for the noble and saintly purpose, but it just ran out of puff, because like me, you're human, as opposed to something that just worked. You don't even have to describe why it worked or what the physics behind it was, but it works. It was meaningful, it was relevant. And I've got to say, you know, every now and then when I stumble into something that, in the cold hard word of, world of business, has opened uh, one's imagination to get connected with the non-for-profit world, it honestly is one of the most profound experiences in my life. Mm. It really is. So, no, I was just going to say, so the art of, of volunteering rather than the science of it, uh, which, I, which I think we tend to, to lose as we become more formal, right? And, and I think that there's, a, there's perhaps a space for, for both to exist because we need the natural, um, uh, you know, very community-based, uh, I want to help out. And it's never, I want to help out just for somebody else. I think that was a, a philosophical standpoint that I think uh, volunteering has evolved from, where you know, we had the charity recipient model, where I'm going to give you for the good, from the goodness of my heart. But actually, um, I would probably even contend that uh, there isn't anything like, uh, you know, it's just helping somebody else. Because every time you help somebody else, you're helping yourself. And that recognition that you're getting something out of it I think is critical. Mm. But I also really want to agree with what Robert is saying, that uh, we, we move from the, the small space into the bigger space, and in that bigger space, we need to look at frameworks and how that engagement takes place. But it shouldn't be at the cost of the, what we heard, uh, I think, was it Jody say today, this morning? You know, what happens at community, at household level? Okay, so there are two things to, to, to pick up on there. I mean, the first one I want to pick up on is the idea of there being something in it for me as a volunteer, as opposed to me doing something for someone else. I mean, is there enough emphasis on that aspect of it in terms of attracting people to volunteer? Yeah, I think it's exactly right that there is. I mean, that's the, um, the guilty secret, isn't it? That it looks all very noble, but actually we come away when we've actually done something, some volunteering effort engaged in some way. Um, it's, it's very um, uh, self-affirming and, uh, and it, it feels good. And well, actually, it can be more than that, too. I mean, in the developed world, it can be a stepping stone to a yes. career. Absolutely, or... absolutely. And in our experience, actually, we, um, we have many an example where uh, vulnerable and disadvantaged Australians that we're working with every day, um, we've got experience of housing homeless people um, who actually the next step in, is community <sighs> engagement, and that's experienced by actually volunteering. Um, somewhere. It might actually be volunteering in a kitchen, uh, serving food uh, to people. It might actually be um, volunteering in a community uh, gardening effort. And that actually um, empowers the person. Uh, they actually feel that they are participating in society again, that they've got a, a reason to get up in the morning and that they're contributing. Um, it's, it's amazing the transformation that occurs um, from what was, you know, someone who was um, the recipient, if you like, of, of uh, service and help, actually now reaching out and, and uh, providing services and support. Um, so that social inclusion that uh, the person experiences is really um, helping them um, re-engage in society. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in your two categories, because I'm aware that everybody, or a lot of people here, are from very diverse backgrounds and very diverse circumstances in terms of volunteering, which, you know, everything from, you know, it can mean the difference between life and death in mm. some situations to, you know, to mm -hmm. stepping stones mm. to careers and so on in different contexts. Mm. Um, do you think that the division that, that Amanda suggested, those two categories of, you know, the grassroots kind of volunteering that's, mm. that's more immediate versus the frameworks applies pretty much across the board? I mean, are they the two, are they two categories that we can sort of take apart and start looking at and talk about? I think I'd probably um, frame the categories as um, 
we see uh, an increasing desire, especially from corporate organisations, to approach us and ask for skilled volunteering opportunities. So people applying their, um, you know, day-to-day -day skills into into a not-for-profit environment like ours, for example. Um, we have a lot of volunteers who are actually engaged in program delivery. They're teaching, you know, um, language and literacy to recent migrants or refugees, for example, um, and uh, and. And we have people who are engaged in supporting the events and fundraising opportunities that we have as well. Um, and people reconnecting with the community in, in a social inclusion perspective that I just spoke about. So um, there are a number of different ways and perhaps broadly they can be categorised as sort of the larger, more um, uh, orchestrated ways and, and the grassroots, but there's probably a nuancing in there with a, with a couple of other areas as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's actually a sort of a three tiers. And this is a challenge for the volunteering sector. And I'm acutely aware that everything we say today is contextual to your own geopolitical circumstances, the nature of government, and also the nature of altruism within your own cultures. Um, certainly what would apply here in Australia may not apply in Korea or China or Russia or the Middle East, but some of it may. But in Australia, I think we have three things. One is we've always talked about it as the sort of good neighbour. You do things for the neighbour, but that's not really volunteering. Uh, this is how we've seen it in the past, because it didn't happen in a formal way and it didn't involve an institution. Mm -hmm. The second that's emerged is the corporate volunteering, where actually they are paid. They're paid by the organisations to come and volunteer during the time in many of the models, whereas traditionally the volunteer hasn't received any payment other than for expenses, and that's a new form. And then the third, more traditional way in Australia has been volunteering through not-for-profit organisations mm. or indeed any other organisations. I heard of a volunteer who volunteers in the police force the other day and apparently that's quite common. But I only make one comment. You have to be very careful about talking about volunteering as being this big mm. when in fact you're trying to engage governments and they won't engage that big. What they want to do is they will want to talk really about the formal sector. They'll really want to talk about volunteering in a more formal way. What they'll talk about in terms of that community engagement as being an active civil society in a slightly different way. Now, some of you may disagree with that, but once you start to talk about an activity being this big, the government says, well, we don't have to worry about that. That's just the way society operates. If you want government to engage in any way, shape or form, whether it's through tax concessions or other benefits or direct involvement, then, in fact, sometimes it's necessary to have a more formal notion, but I think that's highly contestable and purely dependent on the, uh, the background. Amanda? Uh, are we allowed to disagree yeah. a little bit? Are you allowed Absolutely. to disagree all you like? <laughs> um, I think to, to, a, to a degree um, uh, I probably agree, but um, I think it's, it's important for us to volunteers, um, for example, if you take crisis, a country in crisis, so a country that usually has disasters. Australia, I understand, has um, the, um, the bushfires, yep. right? And if you want uh, members of the community to be engaged in preparedness, uh, you don't necessarily want to formalize that, but you want government to come up with policies and, uh, and capacity building that enables every member of the community to be able to deal with that when it comes along. So there's, uh, and, and that's big, that's talking the whole community. Whereas I think what you're talking about is uh, where you're thinking of organized, um, uh, in, you know, volunteers in organizations. So I think maybe there's a middle ground because, um, because the, the, the reality is that when you listen to the conversations around the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, there's a new narrative that, that is coming. And it's an opportunity for us to say, you know, this untapped resource where members of the community, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about villages or whether you're talking about national level or even international level, want to have a voice, they want to participate and they want to be counted. That is changing and, and any successful government for the next 50 years will have to really take on board that kind of conversation. How do we bring people to be engaged in plans, in strategies, in policies at different levels? So maybe I'm not disagreeing totally, but um, is that a good middle ground? <laughs> you, you've done really well. Okay. <laughs>
it, it's just uh, the issue there is, and many of you in this room are very uh, understand this, is whether you equate volunteerism and civil society as being equal, the same. Mm -hmm. I would probably say they're not. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say volunteering is a part, an essential part, of an active civil society. If you take the Australian model, uh, for 200 years we have developed a very strong civil society and the activity that allowed the civil society to develop was volunteering from the first charity 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that I would equate them completely. So that's fair enough. Mm. Simon, yes. what, what do you think about this, about this definition and what about engaging the corporate sector? I mean, Robert and, Robert and Amanda have been talking about government and about the need for government to, to reach out, but what about engagement? Can I just go on from what was said a moment ago? I think that um, I, I'm absolutely in agreement with, with, with uh, Robert in the sense of what's the bandwidth of government? And, uh, you know, the, in a sense, the bigger the population of so-called people in need, ironically, the less interested government is. I, I actually subscribe to that theory for a whole bunch of reasons. But all I say is that government isn't actually the whole world. There are all sorts of other organisations, our faith-based groups, all sorts of other groups that I think continue quite properly to, um, to increase the, the size of the issue or the opportunity that we're talking about. And um, I think, you know, what, what Robert's really on about is when is the year to government, year of government going to be sympathetic to um, supporting, um, in the case of Mission Australia, for example, financing, you know, whatever, volunteering. And, uh, and that's a very important thing to understand. And also not to waste the government or community's time by just actually pitching something that it actually will never have any interest in. But my question is, when is the year of the corporate sector going to be sympathetic yeah. to this as it, well? It, I mean, I know, that, yeah. I know, for example, there was great trouble trying to get corporate sponsorship for this conference. Yeah. Now, you know. And, and I know that directly through Margaret, who, of course, is one of the saints in the room. She has done an incredible amount of work to get this conference up and actually struck the reality of a corporate sector which wasn't there as much as we would have liked. The reality is that, um, you know, as to where the corporate sector was 30 years ago, we're in a much better place. Basically, there's the rule of what I call Collins Street or Pitt Street. For those of you from, from far away from Australia, they're the two streets in Melbourne and Sydney where most of our top 20 companies are based. And, you know, one of the good things is that over the last 20 years, at least, we've now got a rule. It's called the 1% rule and uh, you know, 1% of profits, um, hopefully pre-tax profits, but after tax will do, um, are invested in the non-for-profit sector. Now, many of you, certainly many of my friends in the non-for-profit sector say, gee, that's still pretty stingy. But the reality is that, um, and, and I'm gonna get a lot of rotten tomatoes thrown at me now, but <laughs> I think it's gonna be very hard to increase that 1%. Why? Because you know, the CEOs and chairman of all these companies, they take your criticism because there's a hurting, needy world out there that would like it to be more than 1%, but on the other hand, they have um, upteen meetings every, uh, every year with the major institutions that own those companies that say, why are you giving our money away? So that's a tension. I just say to you, though, we are actually in a better position than, uh, than we were. For me, the low-hanging fruit is actually everything in and around the corporation, starting with, nowadays, very, very highly paid employees in those corporations. And, uh, you know, as soon as I start thinking about the, um, the net worth, and indeed, in this context, the time and talent that's uh, come out of the, the corporate world, that's where I get excited. And, uh, you know, I spend... Uh, I take every opportunity when I'm dealing with so-called time-poor people. I, I'm almost getting to the point where when a CEO says, Simon, you don't understand, I'm time-poor, I say to them, I do understand what time-poor is, and they're mostly in the non-for-profit world, trying to do mission impossible, not on your salary. But I guess what I'm really saying is that... <laughs> um, what, what, the reason I don't get didactic, you know, I don't put a baseball, because we've got to bring these people along and understand that actually they're going to be more interesting people, more relevant people, and the point that I'm starting to get right now, better people for their business if they've got that 
all-rounded understanding of how the community works. I wonder where volunteering sits, though, in terms of its profile in the business world around social responsibility. And, and I'm interested yeah. in what implications that might have for people in the room. You know, yeah. is volunteering high on the list, low on the list? If you're talking about a company, you know, having a yeah. certain percentage of its profits or whatever going to some social responsibility area, does volunteering yeah. figure very much or is it... Well, is I'm there work for everyone here to do in raising its, yeah, its profile? I'm first going to take a leaf out of Robert's book and uh, remind you all, I really am only qualified, if indeed I'm qualified, to talk from the perspective of this small country. And everything I understand from the overseas experience is just what I read. But I think, Jenny, the answer to your question is mixed. Um, I see some corporations where it just flows in their DNA, no issue at all, no problem and others that, um, actually interesting, may have been good once upon a time, but because of the current culture, the, the management team that's leading it, it changes. And um, that's where we are at the moment in Australia. It's not a given. Um, that do one... you know why it's in some companies' yes, I do. DNA well, and not others? That's very noble of me. Yes, I do. Look, I think it's, um, <laughs> it's basically because we are still talking about people and uh, for the sake of 30 seconds, let me say, the volunteering world is different from place to place, and the corporate world is too. Some of the notable features about the corporate world here are is that it's um, actually quite risk averse. We don't invest in innovation, all sorts of things that are not relevant today. But actually, we are a little bit behind the times. This whole issue of shared value didn't actually start here in Australia. The idea that um, the wonderful thing is there's a new generation coming through, 30-year-olds, who will be managing these companies in 15 years' time. And these are the people that each and every non-for-profit needs to go out of their way to connect with because I see the possibility of a real corporate revol revolution um, in a fairly short period of time. They've done their university degrees. They've got positions of some responsibility in large corporations now. And they're saying to me in droves, it's pretty straightforward to do what a corporation has to do, namely to maximise profit. You know, I maximise revenue, minimise cost, the profit follows. But I am restless. I don't want to commit the next 20 or 30 years of my life just to doing that one thing. And I just say hallelujah. It's great. They are a restless, ambitious next generation coming through. And um, what I think we need to do as a non-for-profit sector is to make their job easier, i.e. they don't have all the answers, but I think increasingly they're looking for the answers to the questions they're posing, not from their bosses, because they're 55-year-olds like me that have done our time, but from the non-for-profit sector. Amanda, you're looking like you want to say something again to me. <laughs> uh, yes, I think um, I, I definitely can't speak from a private sector or corporate sector perspective because I, I am either NGO, civil society is my background, and I have recently joined the, the United Nations. However, I, I would like to take the conversation uh, a little bit more global in the sense that, um, uh, yes, uh, if you look at where volunteerism was in the eyes of the corporate world, uh, 20 years ago, it was uh, almost nowhere, right? And, uh, and, and, and we've shifted that a little bit. And, and uh, we're using the opportunity of corporate social responsibility to say, you know, you, perhaps there are different solutions uh, in how you can engage with volunteerism. And as, as we see people, especially in the developed countries, as we see people getting older, I mean, living much longer, uh, their working life um, uh, becoming longer, there's going to be need for new solutions on how companies um, uh, work with their staff and what the opportunities they provide to them for learning and for further development. Mm. But the other point that I want to sort of bring in there is then um, that when you look at uh, how change is happening, right, uh, we are going to get to a point, and uh, hopefully we get there during my time, um, but we're going to get to a point where people will no longer, it, it won't be okay for corporates uh, to just do business as usual. 
and I'm going to say it in the next sort of 30 minutes. We, we're currently looking at a, a governance report, a volunteerism and governance report. And one of the things that we're seeing is that uh, whereas before traditionally governments were the repositories of, of power, now that is no longer the case. Yes. So the private sector has come in, especially at global level, and, um, and the need for accountability to the citizens is going to force um, companies to act and behave in a different way. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, that's where the opportunity is. So yes, let's take the low-hanging fruit, but let's also prepare ourselves for the long haul. This is a long-term long game, and uh, business has to change. You know, I, I don't want to mention companies, but there is an example of HIV and AIDS, and how businesses behaved 30 years ago, and how differently they are acting now. So let me just leave that for Catherine? Uh, I wonder if I could just maybe take the conversation to um, communities. And, and I um, uh, need to admit here, I guess I speak from the Australian experience. Um, it's interesting, actually, um, to consider that volunteering occurs in communities um, and uh, with people participating who are actually employed. A lot of people who are currently working, um, a lot of families, uh, they're involved in volunteering efforts in the communities in which they live. Um, and, uh, and the community obviously is strengthened by that. We have a very real issue in that uh, in some communities it, in, that uh, have a high proportion of disadvantaged and vulnerable people, high rates of unemployment, actually interestingly we see very low rates of volunteering and participating in volunteering activities. Um, people are away from um, uh, uh, opportunities to join the workplace. Um, they're living in isolated communities, limited public transport, low income, so limited access to transport themselves, um, dealing with a lot of other issues in their lives, so uh, there, there is just not the opportunity to participate um, in the volunteering because they're, they're doing so many other things. And yet, the community could be strengthened by the efforts of volunteering, you know, and getting all of those we touched on, why, why do people volunteer, you know, for the other person, for ourselves, you know, what are the benefits of it? Uh, so, so how much do you engage be, those people? Well, I think that's what we need to grapple with, isn't it? We need to, and this may, we may need investment in volunteering, if that's not counterintuitive. Um, we talked about, is it volunteering giving something for nothing? Well, maybe actually we might need a bit of investment um, to uh, cope with the logistics of volunteering. Um, maybe we need a bit of investment to uh, promote the benefits of volunteering in one's local community, doing community-based projects which are going to get people interacting with their neighbours, um, uh, building safer communities because people know who their neighbours are, um, and actually just uh, improving the environment, so creating a safer suburb to live in, for example. But, but I think here we, we, we have to learn from overseas. <coughs> Australia is... Um, is a bit odd in this regard. Uh, when we do international development overseas in a number of the countries that are represented here, we always have a model that seeks to empower the local community with the intention that the aid uh, organisations will withdraw. When we come into Australia, we don't have that model. Uh, traditionally, what happened is charities um, did things for people. And we've seen that with our own Indigenous people. We've seen that so often. Now, in more recent times, that's changed, but it's not as changed as people would like to think. And if you wish to engage poor or vulnerable people in, in Australia in volunteering, you firstly have to come to a view that within that individual, there is the capacity for that person to take control of their own lives. That is, that they're not helpless and they're not hopeless. They are, in fact, people that have a capacity to, in fact, manage their own lives with appropriate support and resources and development. And that, in family practice, is called an optimistic agenda. It's not because we're all optimistic and hopeful. It actually says, within the person, the same occurs within the community. If you look at a community, you can say that is a hopeless community. It is beyond help. We'll just do things for it. Or you can say, no, within that community of people, there is that capacity with support. And that is a model that we use overseas. We have to embrace that model here. Now, a number of the sessions today, for example, that we've heard, in the, that I've heard, embrace that. 
They actually engage the person as a volunteer, and what happens? Their well-being increases, their level of happiness increases, their connectedness with others increases, and their general overall circumstances improve. Now, that is a trend that is happening, mm -hmm. but it is by no means a trend that is uh, long-standing in Australia. And yet, I think in, in many of the other countries around us, um, they're already doing that. So you're talking about more innovation within the sector itself in terms of the way it engages people? The, the, the sector at the moment has rebadged itself as social enterprises and uh, social innovation, and if you don't call yourself a social enterprise, you're a bit of a pariah. Um, I don't discount any of that. I think it's important. But for some it's a fiction. Uh, because it's all about the way you do things and have you actually changed. And one of the biggest changes for the not-for-profit sector is how do you engage the people that you used to say, we'll help. Now we say mm. we work with them. And my test is not the name that you put on the uh, website. It's actually what you do. And I'll be convinced about the change in the sector when I see people that were former clients actually in decision-making roles, influencing boards, influencing management, being taken to meetings with governments that's when I'll say, yeah, the sector's really changed to something quite different. OK, Catherine, I'll get your response in a minute, but Amanda, you go okay. first. Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, really uh, sort of agree with what Robert is saying there, because um, uh, we, some years back, I think in the, in the 80s, um, I hope it doesn't show my age by saying that, in the, in, the, in the 80s... You don't have to worry with me. <laughs> Good, <laughs> thank you. Uh, in, the, in the 80s, um, in London, uh, a group of young African women came together and decided that uh, they were going to set up an organization for themselves. And the, and the, the, the sort of motto, the tagline, if you will, was, you know, uh, don't speak for me, but, you know, give me the space to speak for myself. Um, uh, because this is, this is for me. And I guess this is, this, is the, this is the concept or the principle that has been taken abroad but is not, I understand that it's not being used here, but it's, it's one that really works because out of there we have, uh, so I mean, I'm, I'm a product of that. I'm a product of working with other African women in the diaspora, uh, looking at empowerment, looking at confidence, looking at personal mastery, leadership, and walking that journey uh, together in solidarity. And that is more sustainable uh, than uh, just doing things for communities, and I think it's, a, it's quite a good point to make. Mm. Catherine, mm -hmm. I'm interested in your view on this from, from an organisational yeah, perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, apart from maybe a misunderstanding on the definition of social enterprise, <laughs> then I think Robert and I are in passionate agreement, actually. Uh, it is absolutely about um, understanding the strengths of people um, across the board. And again, it touches on the very first um, comment that I made on this panel. It's actually recognising the value of every person and what they can contribute. And life circumstances might have actually brought them to a particular position. Um, but it is about organisations like ours in the sector um, empowering people and enabling people to, um, uh, to reach that point uh, for themselves. So absolutely. Do you, do you see, I, I mean, is the distinction between the role of a voluntary organisation <laughs> and the role of the volunteers that work in that organisation? I'm not sure I understand the, the question. Well, I suppose the organisational framework right. versus the people you know, on, who are actually working for that organisational mm. framework as volunteers. Do I see a difference? Yeah, do you see a dis is there a yeah. distinction that you see organisationally? Like when, do, I, think, I think Robert I understands I what I mean. Well, let, let me, Catherine can answer this, but the answer is absolutely yes. In fact, the, the non-profit sector in Australia has a significant problem, and that is as we move to a much more professionalised workforce in many of the human service areas, which was necessary, uh, a mistake was made, but it was a mistake that people warned about, and that was that they mistook the word professional to mean employee and unprofessional meaning volunteer. Now, I've always rejected that notion from the day it started, but the tragedy was that many organisations effectively either got rid of volunteers or put them on the side. And that was a mistake, and it's been a mistake which now many organisations are retreating from. Mm. But many organisations do not involve volunteers in any decision-making whatsoever. Uh, they don't invite them to tables around strategic planning. They don't seek their guidance. And I think there has to be a real shift in the way in which non-profit organisations, 
as, as well as others, engage volunteers. And I think we, that's one of the great challenges in Australia. But I wouldn't be surprised if that's true in many of the Western countries, because Australia replicates pretty much what happens in many of the Western-style countries. Mm. Is, is there tension between paid staff and volunteers in expectations around their roles? Mm. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't say tension. I think in any organisation that's relying on volunteers, and perhaps it's actually how we approach um, uh, a volunteer assignment, you know, as an individual, are we actually approaching it um, with uh, the same degree of commitment and certainty in terms of uh, and longevity um, as as we might <laughs> approach paid employment? Um, so that's a that's a question. Um, in terms of uh, the sophistication of the sector, um, the, uh, the need to actually uh, deliver services, we're a heavily regulated uh, sector. Um, we take on a lot of risk now uh, in terms of the contracts that we're delivering, the services that we're actually providing. Um, there is a need to actually understand what, um, uh, uh, you know, good practice actually looks like. Uh, we've got a lot of evidence now about what works and, and uh, what works less well. Um, so uh, I guess I um, do uh, uh, hesitate um, in, uh, in saying that uh, the days of old, if you like, where organisations um, like ours were run purely on a volunteer basis were the glory days to which we should be, um, you know, aspiring. Uh, and that because now we are actually um, an organisation and organisations like ours in the sector have a paid workforce delivering services and engaging others to work with us, perhaps on a volunteer basis, that, that that's perhaps not, not where we should actually be. So I would hesitate that uh, that yeah. was the intent. I don't think that's what you were no. saying, was oh, it? Oh, no. The glory days are full of terrible things, <laughs> um, including inefficiency, um, uh, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, lack of good quality governance. Um, I don't want and to go back to the glory right. days. People, presumably, as um, well. But what I do think is the pendulum swung. The other reason, can I just be very clear about why it's a critical issue now in most of the Western countries, um, is the governments will not be able to provide, through funding, the services that the community will demand of it. Now, I'll give you an example in Australia, um, aged care. Most of our aged care in Australia will be provided within the home. Australians choose that. And so going forward by 2050, um, three million Australians will receive aged care every year, but only 600,000 of those will be in an institution. Um, the government will be able to provide aged and health care. It will not be able to provide any funding for social engagement. So we will have the loneliest, most depressed group of elderly people in the world. We already do. Yeah. And what will change that, what will change that is volunteerism yep. and the not-for-profit sector, yep. who will be, have to engage the rest of the community in the provision of social supports for the elderly. Now, people will say, well, that's not going to happen. Well, I'll tell you, it's already happening. Yeah. Governments will restrain its resources to what the absolute essential services. But if the person sits there for 23 and a half hours every day with no friends, no visitor, no companionship, well, government's not going to come to the rescue for that person. And I have to say to you, I don't think they should. Mm. I, which leads to... Yes, Simon, sorry, you go next, just... and then it leads to my next question. Yep. I'm sorry, Jenny, I'm going to upset your order very quickly. I want to go back to something that Robert did say a little while ago about the... Just move closer to the mic. Sorry, about yep. the... Um, uh, I guess the difference, if you like, between non-for-profits operating overseas versus here. And, and I think he, he made a very helpful comment, I think. Let's just at least have one split here before, between the developed and the developing world. I know it's much more complicated than that, but it was, I think, very helpful. Um, I'm actually not so pessimistic about how our non-for-profits operate here. Um, it, it reminded me when Robert was talking that, yep, been overseas, spent lots of time with um, aid agencies over there, and saw their work in developing communities. And it didn't take me very long sometimes to realise that when these communities hadn't had education, hadn't had the basic agricultural inputs, the um, communication technologies that I'm used to, um, all of a sudden I saw that, frankly, they had many more talents than I did. And when you injected those bits and pieces in there, 
issues such as um, their ability to survive indeed, sustain and prosper all of a sudden happened. And in truth, I think many of our aid agencies, if you like, and I'm now trying to talk globally, are actually trying to identify those communities that can actually be helped fairly efficiently and all of a sudden they're off. Now in truth, I think the challenge here in the developed world where we have better um, you know, education systems, etc., is that we're left with a rump that actually notwithstanding what they have been given, and I know I'm going to get the language wrong, I apologise in advance, but at the end of the day, you know, they are left for often the non-for-profit sector, sometimes funded by government, to be dealt with. And it's a different challenge. Interestingly, I bring it back to volunteering because in this incredibly efficient world we live in, and it's interesting, Robert, I just transferred last week my older disabled sister who you know, I've been happy to care for in her, in her own home for the last 30 years, but it's got to the point where she had to become institutionalised. And I spent an hour and 20 minutes this morning on the phone to Centrelink, mainly waiting, to get a response to a question. That's okay. That's the world I live in. During that hour and 15 minutes of waiting, every five minutes I was reminded by a machine that I was in a queue and all that sort of stuff. That's the way the Western world works. And I think part of the anecdote to all of that is what we're here today about. It's volunteering. Let's humanise the challenge that someone um, you know, like Catherine has. She is working with Australia's um, vulnerable and they've already had that opportunity of education and they're not starving typically, etc. but they are still vulnerable. And I think what they're actually missing out on is the opportunity to mix, the opportunity for people like me just to spend time with them. I want Amanda's perspective on this. Well, I was just, um, just a very uh, brief comment, really, that um, the, the differences that we perceive, um, uh, some of them are real, but some of them are, you know, let, let's, uh, let's just sort of um, put a caution on, on them. Uh, I've worked both in the very poor countries as well as uh, in the UK with the disadvantaged communities. Uh, whether it was, uh, you know, uh, people with the mental health uh, issues or experiencing domestic violence or underprivileged uh, young people. And uh, there is a basic uh, human need, irrespective of where you are and where you come from, irrespective of what uh, governments can or do provide, right? And that basic need is uh, you, you just want to live a life of dignity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and I think that um, we cannot um, legislate uh, around every single element of uh, our ability as human beings to touch each other, but I think there are some elements that we need to, and, and here I'm going into a different conversation, that we need to be able to measure evidence and resource uh, as, as, as a people globally because there is a shortage of resources the human resource, if you look at it as human capital, remains perhaps the most sustainable of our resources that we have available. And, and for me, the conversation that I would really like to also hear from, 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 the, from the audience at some point is, um, you know, how do we as a volunteering sector um, uh, position ourselves and the conversation and the contribution that volunteers make to development at different levels. How do we position that in a narrative that governments and the businesses can understand in a language that they can grapple with, deal with, and be able to resource? Because I think for me that's, that's where the future is. And that's where I would really like to, to take the conversation. Okay, forward. about some ideas around how, how you can reach people essentially with the, with the message. Well, I think yeah. it's, it's more than that. It's about how you do engage, in a sense, governments as well in that conversation. But I think this is very important. A number of the uh, countries represented here today, volunteering is in its infancy. It's not a natural part, um, or certainly not a formal part of their society. Um, and I think there's a real, and, and your point raises this, there has to be an agreement within the governments and the not-for-profit sector more generally about what is the real purpose and role of volunteering. And the second what flows from that is, if you can get agreement about that, is what are the impacts that people see as coming out of volunteering, a not-for-profit endeavour, 
and whether or not the governments are prepared to support those. One of the conversations is we're asking governments to support, but I'm not convinced the governments actually want to support some of the stuff we're putting forward. Either they don't believe it to be the case or we can't demonstrate it. And one of the things the Productivity Commission report did, which I was the presiding commissioner on, was to try to do that, to create a framework by which the sector could actually prove over time the impacts that it claimed. By doing that, you can engage governments. And many of the governments you're dealing with, volunteering is completely and absolutely new, and in many countries, they don't trust it. They're not sure of it. They, they're not sure about civil society more generally. So one of the things the so is part of this is, about measurement as well, about measuring. Yes, but not necessarily with numbers, and that's going to sound very odd. Um, I absolutely believe that where you can put a number, you should. But there are many things in society that we value that we cannot measure in numbers. And even the Productivity Commission, which people may not understand, is the principal body to advise the Commonwealth Government on economic and social matters, um, said that. There's only so much you can measure, and you shouldn't try to measure the rest. You should be able to identify it, but, and that's quite important. The question I'm saying is, have we got agreement within the sector and then with the governments and the corporate world as to what we're about and what impacts we want to be able to demonstrate? Okay, let's take some questions. Anyone, anyone got a question they'd like? Can you stand up and yell out if you have a question for the panel? Yes, up, right up the top there in the middle. Can we take a mic up there? Could you stand up, please? Thanks. It's a long climb up there. <laughs> um, thank you. My name's Pat Pearce, and I'm a volunteer with um, Red Cross in Victoria. Um, I just want to ask both Robert and Catherine a question and follow on from something Robert just said. I think governments measure things by unemployment. They measure community status by unemployment, how much welfare they have to give out, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there's a real capacity for governments to reframe that in terms about what can a community, what, what capacity does it have within its own self? I've worked a lot in the Parks Community Health Service in South Australia, and we saw many examples of those people who had the lowest socioeconomic scores when they're motivated and provided just a little bit of impetus, build up into really strong communities. So my question is, how can governments, or should governments be reframing how we label communities with, with indicators of disadvantage, which I believe personally depowers them? Well, Catherine may have some practical experience. Um, in Victoria, they've developed a wellbeing framework which is applied to communities across that state. And it's quite innovative work, and it does exist in other countries as well, where they've basically taken communities and say, what would be the indicators of a strong community? Or I think that's what it's called, a stronger communities. And then they've tried to say, well, how do we know if we're actually achieving that? So they've tried to come up with a measurement framework, imperfect though all measurement frameworks are. And I presume that the not-for-profit organisations involved in that are being required to demonstrate the impacts. Catherine, can, can mm. you comment on that? Yes, yes. So we're familiar with the wellbeing index, and it is certainly, it is that qualitative, and it's good to hear a productivity commissioner recognising those softer measures are just so vital, aren't they? Because we are people at the end of the day. We're not actually numbers. Um, and uh, so the wellbeing index, yes, needs to measure um, things like, you know, the... the um, uh, the, the personal well-being of people in that community, of the, the social inc inclusion activity, if you will, be in that community. And yes, we do have examples of, and it is that modest investment. And if you, if you talk in, in economic terms and return on investment for a very small um, investment with uh, somebody just working with the community, yes, playing uh, to people's strengths. We're not here about, you know, actually just, um, uh, you know, going in and, and uh, presuming to actually know what that, uh, that uh, people in the community would actually like to be involved in, but actually spending time in the community, understanding the members of the community, playing to the strengths and uh, enabling and equipping people to, at a grassroots level to start getting involved in their communities and, and um, getting involved in activities which are going to provide greater well-being, greater safety, greater security, greater you know, connection with neighbours and neighbourhood. Um, so it is um, 
uh, it can be demonstrated in, in the communities in which we work and we're starting um, to see that happen. Mm. Okay, any more questions? Anyone like to? Yes, over here, one over here. Anyone else? That was close. Um, I won't stand up because my right leg has fallen asleep. <laughs> oh dear, we've been that um, boring. Dear me. It's just how I sit, I don't know how it happens. Um, on, on Tuesday, the parliament here passed a law restricting the ability for environmentalists to engage in civil protest um, around coal mines. And that's following a trend that we've seen in uh, Victoria, around the East West Link, also Tasmania, and now the TFA looks like it might be getting ripped up. Uh, in my view, the sorts of people that engage in these kind of activities really embody what volunteering is. Like, it's truly something of your own free will. It's not only not for material gain, it's often to your own material detriment. Um, and yet, as a sector, we've been deathly silent in terms of some of these policies kind of getting pushed through government. I'm just wondering if there's more that we can do as a sector, and, and I guess what your thoughts are around that. All right. Anyone like to pick up on that? Um, well, speaking on behalf of Mission Australia, we believe we need to be a courageous voice. Um, we need to be advocating for people in need. Um, we would always um, uh, support the need uh, to be able to be vocal about the issues that, uh, that, that we it's understand, that comes from an evidence base, comes from a, a place of um, working in this sector, that, that we work, it's not, not environmental, but it's, it's the um, human services space. Um, but more broadly, advocacy is just such an important um, part of um, being involved in society and, uh, and influencing things that are going to affect people's lives. Did you want to say something, ma'am? Uh, not necessarily from a, an Australian perspective, but just to say that I think uh, the sector uh, has a challenge on activism and advocacy because um, when we've been trying to uh, partner with other organizations, including Ayave, to try and uh, uh, advocate for the recognition of volunteerism at the global level, um, some of the questions that come back to us, which are really hard questions, are questions of, uh, can you tell us exactly what the contribution, not in terms of monetary terms, not the economic, but the, the social uh, value of volunteerism uh, in terms of addressing, for example, the MDGs, both at global level, but as well as at local community levels, right? And, uh, and what we found is that uh, there's, a bit, there's a lot of research that has been done in developed countries. So there's a better understanding of the incidence of volunteerism and what it can do and its potential. There isn't as much in the, in the, in the, in the rest of the world. There is, a, there is a, a real vacuum in terms of understanding that, uh, that contribution. Now, the reason why I think it's relevant to activism is um, if you're going to go and throw stones, uh, you, you really need to have a stone, right? You, maybe that's a bad example. <laughs> Let me think of some bad example. Don't go throw stones. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you're going to go and make your case, uh, if you look at how the domestic violence bills, for example, were won in quite a number of countries, if you look at the, the UK, is uh, they were able to talk about uh, when, a, when a woman is out of work because of domestic violence, her children are out of school, she's out of employment, um, the companies lose out, they were able to document the number of hours that are actually lost by the company and the revenue that is lost and, you know, and, and, and all that. We need to get better at at packaging evidence, uh, evidence mm. our research. We really need to deepen that so that uh, in every place we can actually use that to lobby for the right um, policy environment and to speak up for those difficult uh, issues. But can, I just make, of it. can I just make one comment? There are people in this audience where that would not be the right strategy. Okay. They have governments that would not be conducive to a not-for-profit sector or a volunteer sector advocating in the way that many of us absolutely believe we should and have a right to do so. Nevertheless, I would say to those people that this is where both government and the sector matures over time, where a level of trust starts to develop. And civil society has at its core the notion of societal trust. But that trust is a trust by the citizens and by governments and by other institutions. So I just say to those people, uh, there are not, there are, there are, it's time, uh, there are times when it is not the appropriate strategy, but over time, as the not-for-profit sector grows, the volunteering grows, civil society strengthens. 
and there is a level of trust within society and governments, then in fact that voice that you've referred to uh, is appropriate. Okay, Thank we're running out of time and I want Amanda to have her disagreement here. Yeah, no, I, I, yes, I, I disagree. <laughs> Um, I, I would argue that uh, every movement that we know of in history in any part of the world has started with a voluntary action. It has whether you call it the, whether it's the suffragettes, whether it's the environmental movement, whether it's whichever one you talk about, has started because somebody somewhere decided that out of my own will I am going to stand up against this particular injustice or this inequality. And so, in a way, you can say that we call it activism, we call it something else, but it starts with voluntary action. And, and so, you know, maybe the strategies might be different, but I think that we start there. And we're in an era where... <laughs> and all I'd say is that we're in an era where some organisations can literally expect millions of volunteers on their books. They may not have an intimately uh, close relationship with them, but through modern media, um, they can truly actually say that on their balance sheet, if you like, they have millions of supporters who are doing the important work of, of advocating. I would actually say just briefly, I think the real big issue is not the narrow one as to whether um, you know, a whole bunch of people ought to be able to uh, protest on a mine site. The real issue is actually free speech and indeed the vexed old issue, going back to what Catherine was saying, how much should a government funded agency be allowed to advocate but at the same time call the government to account. Um, that issue's been around for a little while. Mm. Okay, we are going to have to wrap up. A couple of quick things I wanted to ask you. When is volunteering not appropriate? You know, when, when is it filling a space that should be being filled by, by somebody else? And how do, you, how do you draw those lines? Can I just say I'm troubled by the question because if one wants to volunteer, why shouldn't they? I think the only thing I can think of is if, in truth, they're not equipped. You know, I think that occasionally the, the sector has to say, look, I know you want to do that, but in our humble opinion, you're not equipped to do it. Um, but aside from that, perhaps I've missed the question, Jenny. Yeah, but, I'm, but just, I'm, I'm just interested in, I, you know, whether, whether, I, I, I there's, whether there's a point where volunteering yeah. isn't appropriate. I, it should be paid work. It should oh, OK. Be... Yeah. Um, no, I my <laughs> <laughs> Um. <laughs> because this is a really interesting question to me as somebody outside the sector is, you know, wh where do you draw those lines about, no, that's a government responsibility, ah. no, that's a corporate sector responsibility? Well, I think that's, a, but that's absolutely the conversation that needs to be had between the government, the sector and the business community. And that's why the dialogue is so important because there are things that are government responsibility and the not-for-profit sector makes a mistake by entering into that territory because it just simply abrogates the government from its responsibility. Um, there are other things which I think the government could easily withdraw from and are better suited either to the business community or to the not-for-profit sector. The problem is you have to have an engagement and that engagement has to have a basis of trust to it. And hence, this is the conundrum about the, the last comment. If you don't have trust, you can't have the dialogue and you never get the outcome. So, that's the conversation we have, Jenny. Absolutely. There are places where volunteerism or not-for-profit endeavour is not appropriate. But that's a conversation that I think is, uh, we struggle with constantly. OK. And, oh, sorry. Yeah, go on. I, I was just going to say, it does pick up very much the, um, the role of government. And, um, and, you know, I think a dialogue and trust is so vitally important because um, we want to avoid a situation where a safety net is pulled and there's an expectation that there's uh, not-for-profits and volunteers there ready to, um, uh, to catch the falling um, members of our community. OK. Yes, Amanda. I think that um, it's, it's a pity we're running out, we've run out of time actually because I think you've just asked quite a critical question mm. and uh, because uh, especially those organizations here that work with international volunteers, uh, the, the cheap labor argument has really come into play um, and, uh, and, and in times of economic recession we find uh, that uh, the, 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 the boundaries blur a little bit in terms of how volunteers are you, you know, uh, 
how volunteers are treated and for what purpose. So I just want to say that it's a, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting que uh, question and I think it's, it's one that we need to debate, but it's also one that we need to have clear responses to as a volunteering sector. The other side of, of your question, which I thought you had asked, was um, are there instances where volunteerism uh, is negative? Mm. Now, that is a very interesting tension. Yeah. And, uh, and at the moment, there are all sorts of examples that are visible, and I'm not going to mention any because I work for the UN and my boss is sitting somewhere around here. <laughs> so, um, however, um, I, I think that we have examples of where, you know, voluntary free will um, does not necessarily always lead to uh, positive and transform transformational change. To the contrary, it can lead to very unpleasant uh, experiences and so which I, raises questions around professionalism mm -hmm. in a sense in inverted commas in volunteerism too doesn't it or, or, or around standards and expectations and how much you can demand and expect of volunteers in terms of their, their I, I think it, it, it comes back to the definition I, I think it's uh, uh, what we are talking about when we talk about volunteerism surely has to lead to positive change mm -hmm. and anything that doesn't lead to positive change um, Maybe there's another word for it. Mm. Okay, we are going to have to wrap up. I just want to, I, I want to comment from each of you about, about something quite specific, and that is that if you were taking one strong message to the G20 around volunteering, you know, if you had the opportunity to actually get to those people with one strong message, what would your message be? What would, what would you want to get across to the G20 about this issue? Well, for me, it would be um, the very important role that volunteering plays in building social inclusion in, in communities, all communities, and again, speaking from the Australian experience, uh, but specifically the, uh, the opportunity to build social inclusion in those disadvantaged communities. Yeah, Simon? A, a, a not dissimilar point, Jenny, but um, typically governments today you know, what's the most important thing that happens in a given year? It's actually the budget. You know, we, we are in, a, in an era where the numbers are important. And uh, to take Catherine's point a little further, I think it's important that we are continually reminded by all leaders of society, but, but in particular governments, of the importance of this sector, of its not only economic value, but uh, social value, and in particular the fact that it is two-way. It's not, to, uh, this is a point that was made by Amanda right at the outset, but that it's um, a fundamental value to, to the whole of society. And, and all I would say is that it's something that in every country, governments of uh, persuasions as they come in and come out need to consistently say. And it's not actually something a government should feel ashamed about. It's not a cop-out. It's a fact. It's important. Mm. Amanda, you're writing furiously. What are you writing there? Oh. <laughs> Um, I was writing something else, but my message, I guess, uh, <laughs> my message to the G20 would uh, would have to be that um, the, the inclusion of volunteerism in uh, in national plans, programs, strategies, and resources is uh, going to be absolutely essential to accompany the the implementation of any development at local, at national level, at global level, and that we need a new partnership for development, and that new partnership includes the private sector, government, and uh, civil society, and within that, volunteerism as a key mechanism. Mm -hmm. And Robert? Uh, just very simply, the, the message would be that genuine engagement with the uh, volunteer sector or movement will reap uh, enormous benefits for governments and communities. And if that engagement is based on mutual respect and trust, um, then extraordinary benefits will flow to any nation that engages in that process. Mm -hmm. And the, what would you urge people in the sector in this room to do? You know, uh, in, terms of, in terms of community engagement and increasing community for engagement. For the people in this room, it's to actually work out what you want. If I said to you tomorrow, how, what would be the type of engagement you would want with your government in whichever country you are? Could you tell me that? Could you actually tell me what is the nature of the engagement that you want? The sector always says that governments don't engage with it, 
appropriately and effectively. They don't realise that's true. The converse is, do we have a clear view in each country, and it would be different, as to what that engagement is that we seek? Um, and then I would take that to the business community as well. And that's the work we in the sector need to do. Not them, us. Then we can go to governments of all persuasions, um, and I think uh, great things can happen. Great note to end on. Would you please thank our panel? Amanda, Robert, Simon and Catherine. Thanks very much, everybody.